Before 9-11, I used to offer various organizations like churches and universities a presentation on Islam. I got an invitation about once every three months. After 9-11, I was literally besieged with invitations. Islam was in the spotlight. Imagine going to Google to find out which religion is the most searched on the internet. Type the words Christianity and then Judaism, then Hinduism, then Buddhism, and then Islam. I did exactly that, and this is what I found. I found that surprisingly, the searches on the word Islam were exactly double the sum of the searches for all other four major religions. But why Islam? What is it that makes people want to learn about Islam? So again, I went to Google Trends and I typed, Islam and Jihad then Islam and violence, then Islam and terrorism, and then Islam and women. And surprisingly again, I found that the searches for Islam and women were exactly double the searches on jihad, violence, and terrorism put together. So I discovered that Islam is the religion that most people want to know about, and women in Islam is the aspect of Islam which most people are interested in. Since 9-11, I have been traveling around the world lecturing to non-Muslims on the true image of Islam, and I have personally seen many people embracing Islam. And I observed that the women who embraced Islam were many more than the men. Could this be true? Or was I just imagining it? So I said to myself, let me check it out. On the website of the Center of Islamic Studies at Cambridge University, one of the most reputable universities in the world, it states that three-quarters of British converts are women. Gothenburg is the second largest city in Sweden. Imam Ahmed al-Mufti is the director of Gothenburg Mosque. He spoke to us about his observation. During the past few years, around 400 people declared their faith after reading, attending lecture, and coming to ask about Islam. Surprisingly, over 300 of them were women men were only around 25%. When I checked the annual report of Discover Islam, an international organization which is based in the Gulf, the numbers varied from one year to another, but the percentage of women converting to Islam was always around 70%. What about other parts of the world? The Far East, for example. I talked over the internet with Hanan, a Chinese convert and an active member of the Serving Islam team. Serving Islam is an organization that participates in the Hong Kong annual book fair and distributes books and copies of the Quran. In the year 2009 to 2010, for example, over a hundred people have embraced Islam and 97% of those were women. And ever since, we have been witnessing sisters coming into Islam every week, and women were always the winners. That's why our Sunday classes are filled to the brim with sisters, with only a handful of brothers. That now, it's really coming down to a challenge for us, because the Islamic law that the jihadists want to impose upon the world would deny basic things that we take for granted. Freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, the equality of dignity of all people before God, the equality of rights of men with women. Women especially are in a predicament in the Muslim world. I have decided to challenge and to bring Allah to justice on serious charges like discrimination against women. Where is the Muslim feminists? Very few of them exist. Sharia law does not allow equality of rights for non-Muslims and for women. If the reputation of Islam is that it oppresses women and discriminates against them, then logically, it should attract more males than females. But it doesn't. It attracts more women than men. So what is the secret? 
What in the world attracts women to Islam? My first interviewee was in Belgium. Unfortunately, I traveled all that way only to be told when I got there that the lady in question had changed her mind. She didn't want to go on camera anymore. We were desperate and set out to find someone to take her place. Finally, we found Aziza, a mixed race young lady whose father is Flemish and mother Congolese. I asked her about her story. Once she got started, it was as if she knew all my questions in advance. Aziza is someone whom when she speaks, you wish she would just go on forever. I started looking for God, I'd, but at the age of 17, unfortunately, I lost my mother. I was obliged as a Catholic daughter to go to church. I had something like difficulties to believe what church claimed calling Trinity, God, his son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So afterwards, I start reading books, all the books, most of them, and to be honest, the Quran too. But reading Quran is very difficult and quite mysterious. But a few words were very, how can I say, enlightened me, were very strong, like the compassionate that mostly came back in that book. Even if I n could not immediately associate with it, but it felt that I need to follow a path. I left it at the age of 17 and I came to Brussels. And then I was interacting and meeting many communities, Jewish, Christians, and we were interacting and everything went well. But on the other hand, I met a lot of new friends, Burundese Muslims, also Moroccan Muslims, Chinese Muslims, anyway, God opened me for a second time the path to Quran, so I started reading and felt enlightened. I felt better guided. Why did I lose my mother at the age of 17? Even if I not feel alone, and even if I am alone, I could feel his presence, even if defining his presence was not easy at all. So when I was in Brussels, I had the luck to be taken under the wing of a Moroccan mother, Fatima, and she really showed me the real values of Islam by taking care of me as I was her own daughter. She showed me by love, by acts, what Islamic values and ethics means. Really, I was lucky. So afterwards, I started studying Arabic at the mosque. And there my professor, a Tunisian professor, Mahmoud, Explain me or open me at least the way to find more information on Islam on Islam in a very, very broad sense. So he pushed me to go to the library and instead of giving or teaching us the rules, grammatical rules, he opened the door and said, go to the library, try to find out what it means. So he opened me the real path to the Islamic education. But on the other hand, I was still living in my context in Belgium with a Catholic father, who really imposed me still going to church and I start wondering if this was the way I need to follow. So in 2002, even if I was studying Arabic courses, I went to see Imam Mustafa Kestit. Even if I was not ready to become Muslim, I just wanted to know what did it mean to be a Muslim. So he really gave an answer to my questions by asking me two questions. Do you believe in God? And of course I said, yes, I believe him. I feel that he is around. And then he said, did you already read the Quran or other Islamic lectures? And I said, yes, of course, I already tried. But it's very difficult for a first time to read Quran and it's quite mysterious. But a few words came or enlightened me when I was reading Quran and always came back 
the compassionate Rahman, and I was a little enlightened and, and felt uh, better to follow the path of Islam on my own way. Aziza's story about the impact of the Qur'an's powerful words was inspiring, but when it came to the reaction of her family and friends, she tried to be humorous, but her frustration spoke louder than the words. My African friends? Weird friends. You know what they told me? They said that I changed board, that I went to the other side. The other side? Which side? I was supposed to go I mostly went out with them, had drinks with them. I never drank alcohol because I not drinking alcohol from the beginning on. But that was weird. And the family, that's something else. When I told my Catholic father that I was Muslim and that I stopped going to church, he just banned me from his will. He said he didn't want me anymore to be his daughter. And I told him, okay, I'm not your daughter then anymore. So take your will and leave me alone. So it took me seven years to convince him that I'm just his daughter, Aziza Maria Brakeveld, the daughter that he made. But there were others a good deal more aggressive even than Aziza's father. Shazna, a Sri Lankan preschool owner who converted to Islam at the age of 17, tried unsuccessfully to hide the bitterness in her with Allah. Uh, when I embraced Islam and I start to uh, read, recite the Quran in my f- my room, at my home, so my uh, dad said it and he got angry. Once he kicked me and uh, started to scold me. And uh, once he said, "If you are a if you are a Muslim, this is a Roman Catholic family. If you want to be a Muslim continuously, you go out." At the time, uh, uh, I think uh, the time is midnight, three o'clock. My father kicked me out. I miss my friends. I had I had a lot of friends in my school time, so I miss my friends. When I embraced Islam, they didn't talk with me. <laughs> So I love to talk with them. But not all non-Muslim parents were hostile. Priscilla, an Indonesian convert who converted from Christianity to Islam after hearing the call to prayer in Indonesia and searching for its meanings on the internet. She told us about her family's reaction. I was glad because my father said, okay, whatever you choose, I'm glad for you. If you, f- if you feel better with it, then you have to do that, but do it the right way. So I was so glad because I, um, uh, I knew another sister, she had, she had problems with her parents, but my parents was, were very supportive. Priscilla's case was too good to be true, so I asked Amber the same question. Amber is a school teacher from Connecticut in the United States who became Muslim after 9-11 while working in New York. My family accepted me after I converted to Islam. They saw that it made me happy. They saw that it was something that was improving me, not the opposite. They did have some reservations, of course, as anyone would, because they were afraid. They knew a lot of stereotypes from the media about Islam and they thought this might be something that would happen to me, that I would you know, not um, socialize with people that I used to know, that I might dress differently, totally different than them, uh, that things would be totally different. When they realized it wasn't, then they were able to accept me. After I wore hijab, it was again difficult for them because it set me apart. But then it just, it was a process. It took time for them to again realize that it wasn't something that would set me apart. It was just something that was part of my religious and spiritual journey. One of the most interesting people I met was Elizabeth, a German girl who came to work in a hotel in Hergada, an Egyptian resort on the Red Sea, five years ago. She worked in the beach and pool animation team. I visited her in her own after-school project where she told me her story. There was this one day that changed my life, actually. Um, I went with a group of tourists into the bazaar area 
And there was a man, it was Friday, and a man closed his shop just in front of us. And he said that he's going now to the Friday prayer. And uh, I was telling him that I have a group of people with me who wants to spend all their money because they're traveling tomorrow. And how stupid he would be now to close his shop and not to take this money and just, I know that his prices are too high and he will make a hell of money. <laughs> so how come you just close your shop now? He told me, no, I'm a Muslim. It's my duty to pray on Friday. And it made me really think, because when it comes to money, we are all weak. And when it comes to uh, important things in life, I think we all have our family, the first important, and then almost after that, it's money. So I know that this man is living from that, and how come he prefers to pray, and I called it kissing his carpet, <laughs> than taking our money. And that I was thinking a lot about that. I was just completely lost. Everything I used to believe in was changing. I was really asking basic questions about me, my life, my family, what I want in my life, uh, why I'm here. It was time to actually open the Quran and read the Quran. And I was washing for half an hour before I opened the first time the Quran. I don't know why. I, I read in the other book it's about the Prophet's life, that you have to wash before you read the Quran. And I kept on washing and I had a shower <laughs> and I washed again my hands. And I was really scared to touch this book because I, I felt I have to respect the other religion. I don't want to be disrespecting to them. And I just opened it and I started to read in Surah, Surah Al-Baqarah. I just finished it to the half and I convert to Islam. But I said, at the same time, there are so much rules and so much things that will change now. I'm not ready for that. And I was really scared from such a big step. What will my family say? How will I work in such place and being a Muslim? How, how do I uh, change my, my hobbies? Like, I, 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 I love my freedom life. I, 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 I used to depend on myself since I'm 16. I moved out when I was 16. and. Uh, live by myself and there was nobody who had to tell me what to do. I, I know that I can manage by myself everything and now all of a sudden I have to admit that there's somebody much higher who knows what's right for me. So to just admit that it's a big step for my proud and um, it made me very scared and I always just thought about the hijab. What will happen if I wear hijab? Then out of the blue, Elizabeth told me that she had also been a model, advertising Brazilian swimsuits, and spoke about how advertisers treated her as an object. I was a model when I was 15. I wasn't very professional, but you saw me in some cover shoots or in some uh, catwalk shows. I was presenting once the, the, the beachwear of Brazilian uh, breechwear. And I remember this day that they told me, oh, you got on some weight. We cannot use you for the next shooting. And I, I just felt ashamed. I felt, what's the right to speak about my body like that? I, I, I'm a personality. It's not, I'm just not a product. And I feel that even in the, in the commercials and, and, and everywhere, they, they say sex sells. And they use actually this as an instrument just to sell their product. I don't want to be used as an object. And uh, before I was even veiled, I just covered up my body because I felt the eyes of men. I felt they eat me because I used to... <laughs> I, used to, I, I felt I was pretty and they're really eating me when I'm wearing the bikini at the beach and I wanted to wear long sleeve and I started to go even in the pool wearing a t-shirt because I really felt ashamed of how they look at me and just feel, wow, oh la la, like, uh, who's that girl? I don't want to be in any eyes of any man just like, that he's saying something like that and that I'm an object to them, so. Sex sells. It was not only Elizabeth who felt the hungry eyes of men eating her body. Priscilla felt the same and tried to explain about her need for more respect from men. And also at my work, because I work in a, in a restaurant, in a hotel, and sometimes men are looking at me, but I don't feel comfortable at all. And I started to, to change my style of clothes, to wear a scarf, um, to cover this area. So that was a step closer to hijab, so I did it step by step. 
In the past, um, men looked at me like I was an object. Um, I didn't want them to look at me like I was a piece of meat. Um, but that they respect me more. Feminists worldwide struggle hard against the objectification of women. Their studies have found that audiences in the West are exposed to over 2,000 ads a day. On TV, in newspapers, on street billboards, all over the place. Ads sell more than just products. They sell values and images of success. They tell us how to be popular, loved and attractive. They tell us who we should be. The sex object in advertising is a mannequin. Conventional beauty is her only attribute. She is thin, tall, young, long-legged. Most women don't look like that, but they are constantly trying hard to emulate it so as to be loved and desired. The more a woman looks like an advertising star, the more she is accepted in society. Ads like these reduce women to objects and their sexual content is pornographic. This negatively affects the image of a woman. A few years ago, the research of Susan Fisk, professor of psychology at Princeton University, was all over the news. She proved that when men view images of highly sexualized women, the brain areas associated with handling mechanical tools light up. The media does not only shape people's perceptions of women, but also of Islam. Professor Rasha el Dasuki, a Muslim scholar in Al-Azhar University in Cairo, and an activist for more than 30 years in the United States spoke about the media's political agenda. Unfortunately, Islam has suffered from bad media all over the world. Um, I have studied about 58 novels that speak about Islam and Muslims, and it does give a very bad image of Islam. The reason is all these political events that happen around the world are connected to the media. Whenever there is um, a very hot issue, whenever there is a fight over something, whenever there is a new revolution, you find that the media intensifies against the Muslims. And all the old images that we have seen by Orientalists in the 16th century, things that have to do with the Crusades, things that have to do with wars between Muslims and non-Muslims, they bring all these up again, conjure them up in the memory of the viewer in order to bash Islam and make it look bad. So what we advise is that people seek the sources of Islam and talk to Muslim people and not, uh, not think that the media is the only source about Islam and Muslims. Dr. Leila Ahmed, a professor in the Divinity School at Harvard University, met with us and also spoke about the media. The, this, uh, the idea that Islam, Islam oppresses women became just a normal view expressed in the media and so on, even though there was no ground to it. Historically, there's no evidence for this. It was just the prejudice that was being repeated by the media. And many Muslim women felt offended by this, and they wanted to make clear to whoever they were speaking with or wherever they were out in the streets that they were Muslim and they stood by it and did not accept the prejudices. It always disappoints me when I watch uh, the media and I see more falsity than truth about Islam. There's many experts about Islam, but they're not always Muslims themselves. There are people who get information from places that seems to be something other than what most Muslims understand. And I always find that the media will latch on to anything bad someone that happens to be Muslim does. While there are so many millions of Muslims out in the world that are doing great things, great projects, great initiatives, but they're never mentioned. After 9-11, there was a time when I honestly hardly could bear to turn on the television because this was when we were going to war, of course, immediately nine, after 9-11, we were going to war with Afghanistan. And there was endless shots of women in burqa suffering, how we had to go and rescue them. And this somehow, uh, you know, this was Islam, Islamic oppression of women, the burqa was a sign of that, and by extension, any kind of head covering was seen as Islamic oppression. And that became the prevailing narrative in America for a few months. It was really quite distressing. Uh, but, um, so it, it was very much a, a media issue and, and a political issue, but it was presented as women's oppression in Islam, and therefore Islam was just terribly oppressive. 
And that extended, and that was partly why I'm sure women were attacked. You know, young American women wearing hijab suffered the consequences of, of this media representation. A lot of people were getting um, information from the media that wasn't correct about Islam. What I was able to do, and this was a positive thing, was be able to pass on information that was the truth about Islam. People who were wondering about it, um, people who didn't know anything about it, when they found out I was Muslim, they would ask me questions, and I was able to tell them what a great thing Islam is, what it meant to me, how it inspired me. And this was a positive thing that I was able to um, find after I converted. Even though initially I was very scared, I was afraid people would sort of turn away from me and not listen to me. But I actually found there's many people that are open to hearing what you have to say. Uh, they're actually curious. They just don't have anyone to ask. In Belgium, I received information that we could meet a non-Muslim by the name of Harmony, whose brother converted to Islam eight years ago. When it happened, Harmony said to herself, if my brother can become a Muslim, what the media say about Islam can't be true. So she enrolled at the University of Leuven to learn more about the religion. This is what she had to say. Islamophobes hurt the Islam in a way, but on the other side, they make publicity because of their bad behavior and their hurtful sayings. People will start to investigate by themselves, so they will go and look about the Islam. And so, actually, Islamophobes make publicity. Maybe it's not intentional, but they do it. But, yeah, they hurt some people in, in a way. People had a lot of questions, and so they actually started to research Islam. They wanted to know more about it. So even though the media was portraying a negative image, people wanted to know if it was true or not. So a lot of people did go out and find the real answers. And so in, a, in an ironic way, it was a good publicity for Islam, even though what the media was portraying was bad. The number of converts increased significantly after 9-11. At the mosque I used to go to in North Virginia, I used to witness one to two people declaring their faith every week before 9-11. But the month after, I witnessed a case of conversion every day, and some days two or more. This wasn't because of 9-11, of course, but rather because of the demonization of Muslims in the media and the continuous defamation of Islam by Islamophobes, which made many people more curious to learn about it. In my opinion, I think that I would probably convert to Islam, but I know it's been going to be very hard because uh, people will, people here in Europe don't look at the, have a good image of Islam. Certainly, if a Belgian person converts itself, but I think that Islam is one of the most beautiful beliefs, and I really believe that what is written down, it is the truth. So yes, I think I may one day convert to Islam. Next door to Belgium, we met Pauline, a Dutch pediatrician, who spoke to us what made her embrace Islam. When I was uh, 21 years old, I was in the middle of my medical studies. Um, I, I, it, I came to my intention that when I watched the news and it talked about Islam or Muslims, that all of the news, or predominantly all of the news, is negative. Especially when it comes to women, it's always very negative. Something about uh, women not being able to, school, to go to school in Afghanistan, about women getting acid thrown in their faces in, in Pakistan, a lot of bad things. And also in the climate that what was going on at that time in Western Europe where I lived, um, it was very anti-Islamic to my feeling. And I, I, I just followed the media and just believed everything they said, and I had a very negative idea about Islam. During that year when I was 21, I started to, uh, in my free time, get some extra information about Islam. And the reason I wanted to do that is because I wanted to have more arguments about why this was such a horrible religion. I wanted to be able to debate people about it. So in my free time, like I said, I started to read some, to read some stuff, to, to watch some videos about Islam. 
And in the beginning, I could still say, okay, I hate this religion, it's bad because of this and this and this. But as I read more and more, I started to really feel, I, I started to feel liked it. I, there, were, there were things about it that, was, that, that appealed to me as, as a person, as a human being. I started to feel that, okay, I hate it, but yeah, this and this and this is kind of cool about it. And in the end, after, after months and months of reading some stuff, I found out that I couldn't say anymore that I hated it. There was the list of things that I liked was just too long. And um, I, I really felt it was really like, like coming home because it was really like, it really suited my way of how life should, my way of thinking of how life should be. And um, I couldn't help myself and converted. So that's how I became a Muslim. Elisa, a half Venezuelan, half Chinese lingerie designer whom I met in Hong Kong, spoke to me from her heart. One day, suddenly uh, at night, everything turns around in, in, on me and I feel like emptiness and I feel questioning myself so many questions like, what am I doing in this world? What is this life for? And I feel like, confused and and then I start to think like I think there is something that I have to do in this life so I I I, I start to wonder if I need to talk with someone but I feel like that in this world no one can is going to help me and then I think no I think there is a God so I was I, I was like how can I find God where is God I want to talk with God One day I saw my sister praying and then it really touched me, you know, when I saw her praying I was, wow, I think she's talking with God and I want to talk with God also. And then I start to looking about things about Islam and then I search a word in the internet and it said, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. I didn't really know the meaning of this, but uh, I I uh, I was I feel so comfortable with this word, and I try to memorize it. And every night when I go to sleep, I I I, I was because I feel like I was lost in this world, and I start crying. And every time that I go to sleep, I just say La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. I feel so comfortable. And then one day I told my sister, you know, I know a word. In Arabic, I know a sentence, I know La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And then she said, you know, you say this when you convert to a Muslim. And I was like, so I'm a Muslim. So, uh, And then I start to feel like that God was guiding me to find the truth about my life and the true path. So it was like, I feel like some, I feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he opens my heart. Yeah, out of <laughs> in one night like that. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah is the declaration of faith in Islam. It means that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. But before we left Hong Kong, we also met Wing Zi Chang, a certified accountant in an international company who also told us her story. Um... My work gave me an opportunity to work in London for two years. So I went abroad, so I settled my family, got my driving license, and I want to experience what is life. I want to, to really look for life. So at the beginning, uh, me and a few um, girlfriend uh, try to enjoy the European life. We went, we start to go dancing, clubbing, drinking, and stuff like that. Just the normal European life. But slowly I realize that actually it's not good for the woman. I see some very good and innocent uh, friends. They um, start to have multiple relationships. Sometimes I uh, want to take a cab with a girlfriend uh, at night, but she just disappeared after seeing a guy in the pub. Then I realized they are not happy at the end. They are being abused and 
they are just destroying themselves and they don't have any happiness at the end. I start to think this European or Western lifestyle that we always feel superior, but I cannot find an answer within that. I took a flight to Florida and I spent seven days fishing by the pier and I start to look for religion with the Bible on my left hand and uh, Fortress of the Muslim is a prayer book on my right hand. So my religious journey started. So after then after half year of uh, reading, I uh, kind of confirm Islam is the truth. It really fitting to my values. Um, so then I embrace Islam. Back to Elissa. I asked her how she came to the decision to wear the hijab. When I started to work, I was really scared about it, you know, wearing the hijab and when everybody's looking at you and so normal and suddenly you are with a hair covering. But then I meet a teacher and my teacher gave me a really good concept about God. If you believe in God, if you believe in Allah, He will make it easy for you. And I was, yes. I start to get this concept, but still I was not that brave enough. And then one night I got the Quran and I say, Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going, uh, I need to be better Muslim and I will follow you no matter what you will tell me this night, what I have to do. And I just opened the Quran and there was the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam to tell women to cover themselves. And I just started crying. I was, oh, mashallah, I cannot deny this message from Allah. And then the next day when I went to work, I talked with my supervisor and then I said, you know, I'm not Muslim and I'm, and I was not devoted at all, but slowly I'm, I understand the true meaning of my life. And I really want to go to work with wearing my head scarf. And then she said, yes, it's okay, do it. And then I start wearing my scarf and I see a huge difference. I was scared how people would look at me, but when the women of my office, they look at me, they were like, oh, why are you wearing a headscarf? And then I said, because I'm a Muslim and I can talk to them about Islam. And, I, and there was the most happy part of me in my job that I can talk about Islam. And when I approached some of the male colleagues, they, the way how they looked at me was more respectful than before. And that is when I feel like, Okay, this is what I call the, the honor of a woman. The West has many concepts about that. They don't understand that it's not just a piece of cloth that one puts on their head. It is uh, a sign of, it's a badge of honor. Uh, we consider that it is because women are so um, special that they are not just a physical object. They are not just sex objects. Wearing the cover is a sign of obedience to Allah. Nobody has told her to put this cover on. It comes out of free will and out of deep conviction that she wants to obey Allah and this side. Now, some people tell me that when we wear the cover, we become more self-confident. Surely, because the man does not look at her as just a sex object or as a body, but he would like to speak to her, understand her, understand how she thinks, how she behaves. From time immemorial, men have been using women as tools of enjoyment. When a man is depressed, he goes out to have some fresh air and goes to a shopping center or mall. He buys a cold drink and sits outside or by the window to watch women, not men. After a couple of hours, he feels good and he goes home. When Islam tells women to wear the hijab, it is saying, enough is enough. Women, cover up. You're not for public use. Do not let them use you like that. It also gives me freedom that I, I can respect myself as a woman. I don't need to wear for you, man. I wear for myself. I wear for my husband. I don't need to please you because I need this job. Islam actually gives me a right to wear 
uh, proper clothing and I'm not forced to do it. In the beginning, I first I, I wore a hijab when I prayed. It started to bug me a little bit that I would wear the hijab while praying and then take it off and go outside. I started to feel that Allah, or God, as, as we say Allah, sees me always, not just when I'm praying. So if I go outside, he's also there, and he's also watching me. It's not just a, a thing when you're praying. So I decided about half a year after I converted to, to start wearing the hijab. And ever since, I've been wearing it, never took it off. What about the women who do not wear the head cover or scarf? Should we look down on them? Absolutely not. They are just as respected, as dignified as all the other sisters or women in Islam. They consider that covering the head is a step higher or maybe a step forward. Later on, maybe in life, she would like to pick up the head cover. But when she understands more about it, nobody forces anybody to wear the head cover. As women in Islam, we have to wear a veil. And personally, I think wearing a veil is a process. It's not a trendy kind of stuff. No, women need to have the time to know how they're going to wear the veil and how they're going to behave. Because wearing a veil is a responsibility. And inshallah, I will wear the veil. Just like converting to Islam was a process, wearing hijab was also a process. I didn't wear hijab when I first converted to Islam. I waited for a while until I thought it was the right time. I, of course, I didn't want to upset my family. I was afraid of losing friends. I didn't want to not be able to find work. And uh, I was living in New York City after 9-11, so it wasn't really a very friendly time for Muslims. But I knew I wanted to do it, so one day I just decided that I would wear hijab, and I did. When it was time to take the next step, uh, I, I, I went one week with wearing hijab to work. And uh, they told me that uh, you cannot work with hijab in this place here. So I told them that actually it's one week to go to Ramadan and I, I really want to wear hijab. And I told you three months ago that I'm a Muslim. When it comes to Ramadan, I, I'm going to wear the hijab. I didn't have any knowledge, but I knew that Ramadan is a very holy month and I wanted to wear hijab in this month. Why and however, I didn't know by then, but I just felt I have to do that. And they offered me the double of the salary if I just take it off and stay for the next season because all the kids love me and they want to come back only for me. So please stay and they gave me an apartment, they gave me the food, they gave me everything. So when they were just firing me because of that, I was completely in the street. They told me, you have one week just to pick up your place, uh, to, to clean up your place and uh, get your stuff out of your apartment and then uh, we don't want to see you again. When I was actually cleaning up the apartment and I went back to the hotel for once, they kicked me out by the security. They kicked me out by security because I'm not allowed to go in this hotel again. I'm not working here anymore and I just wanted to visit one of my colleagues to say goodbye to him and they kicked me out by security. I had one week to find a solution for myself, uh, where to stay, what to do, how... I didn't even have money to take a ticket back to Germany and I knew I don't wanted to go back to Germany. And um, two weeks before that, I had an uh, incident that I met somebody who was meeting me every day after work, who answers questions about Islam and the questions I have. He was the first person who was actually just interested to help me about my Islamic interest, who doesn't say, why don't we go after work and have a coffee and then I will answer your question. No, he was the first one who said, um, any question you have, just ask me and uh, I will try to help you. And if I don't have the answer, I will call people who can have the exact answer. So this person told me that he has lots of contacts in Cairo. He can maybe help me to have, a, have work. And um, we went to Cairo and he introduced me to a family who are only girls uh, and uh, an old lady with her two daughters. And I was living with them for four months and they just gave me a home until I found a job and settled down and found my own small apartment. And they were just showing me how to live as a Muslim with all details. The reaction of Priscilla's family to her decision to wear the hijab was not very much different from their reaction to her embracing Islam. 
and I was afraid in the beginning because I didn't know about the reaction of people. My mother in the beginning said, okay, do you have to wear it always, all the time? I said, yes, it's something I want to do to, to come closer to God, uh, to come further in my religion. Um, my father said, yeah, why don't you let her? Because that's her choice. So if she wants to do that, then we have to supp uh, be supportive. My family accepted it. It took a long time, probably another couple years for them to accept that because it was something that they felt um, set me apart from them, that it made me look different than them. Like I, I wasn't part of the family because I look so different. And that was hard for them. It took a long time for them, like I said, a couple years to accept that change. But now uh, they, sometimes my mom even buys me scarves and she'll put my picture even with me wearing hijab in our family Christmas card photos that they send out to all their friends. And so at this point, they've accepted me the way I am, and they realize that Islam makes me happy, and wearing hijab for me is part of Islam. Uh, so that's been, it was a process, it took a long time, but I was able to just stick with it, and things did change for the better. I did lose some friends um, when I converted, when I wore hijab, but to me, those people weren't true friends. People that are true friends will be able to understand the changes that you make, and they'll be able to accept you for who you are. And I do have a lot of great friends that uh, I've had from childhood and that are still my friends, no matter what change I go through. The work life, uh, when you become a Muslim, especially in a European country, always have, uh, has some uh, challenges because you wear the headscarf, the hijab. Sometimes I had to, to leave my work uh, on the side and start ask, answering questions about uh, the hijab. I say, okay, can we finish our work first and talk about the headscarf after because I'm very busy and I have to go. They always pay attention to the outfit. And this is very humiliating for women generally in the world, not uh, only for Muslim women. It is, and it's very, very nasty when I see this coming from women. I, I see women who discriminate other women because of their outfits, what they wear, not who they are, who they, what they believe in, if they're righteous, if they're educated, if they can offer to the world, if they can offer to society, if they can benefit the world, but what they wear. And this is a crime. I mean, it would be interesting to do a study of the relation between the hijab that Muslims wear and the dress that nuns wear, because I think it was in the 60s that the Catholicism abolished the requirement of dress for, for nuns in, uh, in the West. But now there's a movement of nuns to go back to some kind of what we call headscarf or head, head covering. So it'd be interesting to do, but I haven't seen a study yet comparing the, the movement for return to, to conventional covering for, among both Catholics and Muslims. Dr. Leila wasn't to know that I have been doing exactly that, especially in churches around the world. When I'm asked about the hijab, I ask them in turn, who of them has ever seen a woman wearing hijab before? And of course, all of them raise their hands. Then I ask, who among you has ever wondered why they wear it? And 90% of them raise their hands. Then I show them this picture, then I ask, do you know who she is? Yes, they answer. Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. And I show them this picture and I ask, who is she? They say, Mother Teresa, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate. And I ask them, may we say that in your eyes these are the best two women? And they say yes. Then I show them a picture of a Muslim woman and I ask them, what is common to these three images? They say, the hijab. All three are covered except for faces and hands. And I say, excuse me, a minute ago you were asking me why Muslim women dress like that? But some Muslim women do not only cover their hair. There are those who also cover their faces wearing what's known as niqab or sometimes burqa. I met one of them, Naima a British convert of whom the British newspaper The Daily Telegraph wrote, that Muslim woman could be happier than you.
She is also the chief editor of Sisters Magazine, as well as a prize-winning author of many books, including the popular From My Sister's Lips. She told me that when she was still searching, she went to an evangelical Christian church, attended the ceremony, and then wanted to know more. I went back to the back where they were taking people who had said that they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, and I said, I, I want to know how I can know this is the truth. What's the proof? And she said to me, you just have to believe. You just have to believe. And I said, I, well, I can't do that. I need something more than just blind faith. So I left that, went to university, and my first encounter with Islam that I became aware of was when I came to Egypt. And interestingly enough, it was actually seeing women wearing hijab that made me very, very, very upset. Um, I disapproved of it 100%. Considered myself a feminist, cosmopolitan feminist, and the sight of these women covering themselves, I felt sorry for them. I thought, you know, why do the men make them wear this? You know, what's this all about? And then one day, I went to, we went to a festival and there was a lady there. She was wearing a hijab. And she was very, very beautiful, mashallah. She had uh, one of those faces which radiated light. She was a very lovely lady. And I thought, no, I'm going to ask her. I'm not going to assume. I'm going to ask her why she wears that thing on her head. So I said to her, you are so beautiful. Why? Why do you cover yourself? And she smiled at me and she said, because I want to be judged for what I say and what I do, not what I look like. And for me, I'd never, ever heard that idea ever in my life. And it made me really start thinking about my lifestyle, my ideas, my values. And I thought to myself, when I saw these women, I saw them as weak. But now when she says that to me, when she says that she doesn't need male attention, she doesn't need male approval, I think maybe I'm the one who's weak and she's the one who's strong. And I wonder whether I could be as strong as that. So when I went back to England, I... Um, got a copy of the Qur'an and I started reading it. And I said to myself, I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to read the Qur'an because maybe now is the time in my life that I may to need to make a choice for my spiritual side, uh, which I had been ignoring all this time. Uh, I never got around to the Bible in the end. I just read the Qur'an and uh, it made sense to me. Um, the lifestyle choices made sense to me. It seemed like a very sane and healthy and safe type of life. Uh, and I thought if I ever have children, I would want to raise them in a strong belief system and in, in, a, in an environment that fosters the best that is within them. Uh, and that was the end of one journey and the start of another journey um, within, within the deen, within the, the religion of Islam. Personal question. Why did you choose the niqab? I actually liked the niqab. Uh, I like the idea of privacy. I like the idea of... Uh, it not being, my face not being on show for just anybody to see. Uh, I remember specifically one incident uh, that made me decide to start covering my face is when I was going home, it was quite late, and I was going home from work on the, on the train. And I was standing up because there were no seats available. And some men who were sitting on the chairs were staring at me. And I remember feeling very upset and angry, thinking, who do they, you know, why do they think they have the right to just look at me, you know, in, in my face? Um, and I said, oh, I don't like this. You know, I want to be able to choose who sees me and sees that part of me and who doesn't. So I started uh, covering with the niqab then, just on and off, not all the time. But the time that I actually took on the niqab as a, an act of worship, which is how I see it now, not just something that's convenient or something that, you know, helps me achieve certain ends, uh, was when I went to the doctors and I did some tests and uh, there was a fear that, that I may be ill. Uh, and at that time, I was just newly married. Um, it was a very wonderful time, mashallah. And I went to the doctors and everything, I was given the all clear. And I remember walking down the road, this is in, it was in East London, and saying to Allah, to God, thank you for everything that you have made my life into right here, right now. How can I praise you more? How can I worship you more? How can I thank you more? The niqab, I don't see it as con obligatory, but it's considered by many scholars as something that is recommended. It's, it's rewardable. It's something that you do to gain the pleasure of God. And I thought, this is something that is not hard for me. Why don't I do it? This would be something that I'm doing extra to show my gratitude to God. Uh, and that's when I actually started to wear the niqab uh, sort of full time. According to most scholars of Islam, covering the face is not an obligation. 
At the time of the Prophet Muhammad, there were women who covered their faces as well as those who did not. There is no record of the Prophet telling any one of them to cover or to uncover her face. That was something totally left up to every woman to decide. How do we look at these women? Do we consider them um, strict? Do we consider them different? Absolutely not, because there's a variety of opinion. The minimum that one should cover, um, or should leave uncovered rather, is the face and the hands. But if one wants to put more cover, like wear several pieces of clothes, or extra coats or whatever, or wear a, a face cover, this is also allowed. Um, some women are more bashful than others. They, would, they are more beautiful than others. They choose to cover their faces because their beauty should just be for themselves and for their husbands. And absolutely, they do have that uh, option. So we should respect all women, whether they are just covered or that they have a face cover. In some European countries, niqab is now banned. Police arrest women who cover their faces and fine them. Right-wing politicians defend this law by saying that covering the face is against European values. Is it really against European values? I ask myself. The funeral of Emperor Franz Joseph. From 1848 until his death in 1916, the Emperor of Austria. Apostolic King of Hungary, King of Bohemia, King of Croatia, King of Galicia and Lodomeria, and Grand Duke of Krakow, and up to 1866, President of the German Confederation. These women we see in the funeral train of Emperor Franz Joseph are not from Saudi Arabia. They are the princesses of Europe. Women of the royal families and aristocracies of Europe used to cover their faces in funerals and at weddings. The media needs symbols. It, uh, it needs symbols of oppression. It needs symbols of backwardness. Um, and it's chosen niqab as its symbol of, of oppression and backwardness and call to gender rights and things like this. Um, so in terms of the media, there's not really much that one can do sort of, you know, to, to tackle the media except for trying as much as possible to put positive images of women in niqab out there. You know, the more women we have in niqab, who are achieving great things, who are going out there and making a difference, the more the public perception of niqab starts to change. I, I, it upsets me when people see the niqab as something that holds women back. I don't believe that. Yes, there are restrictions and there are things that are more difficult for you, but it depends on who you are as a person. Because if you are hardworking, if you are determined, if you believe in yourself, if you have great ideas, if you're a people person, the niqab makes no difference because people will get over that by the force of your personality. I believe that because that's been my experience. Um, you know, in, within my work, uh, I've gone into schools, I've uh, lectured in university halls, uh, I've been on television, on radio, etc. You know, talking about other things, not only the niqab. And at the end of the day, if you're an intelligent woman, you're intelligent whether your face is showing or not. If you're funny, you're funny whether your face is covered or not. If you're kind, you're kind whether your face is covered or not. And it's up for, to society to be open to receiving what women in niqab have to offer. And it's also up to women in niqab to go out there and make a space for themselves and make that space where they can contribute to society. Dr. Leila Ahmed's famous book, A Quiet Revolution, explored the phenomenon of the spread of hijab in the U.S., but to study this phenomenon, she had to study it in Egypt first. The idea that Islam oppressed women and therefore you needed imperialists to liberate Muslim women was a British imperial idea. It developed in the 19th century, late 19th century, when they, uh, and it was very strong in Egypt, but also in India. And of course, the, the uh, imperialists believed not only Islam, they believed Hinduism and anything else, was op anything that was not British. <laughs> and why it was oppressive to women. So ju they justified their reasons for ruling in these places and for retaining power and refusing to give the local people power was that their way of life, their religion was superior and Islam was inferior. 
In the late 19th century, when the British began to propound the idea that the sign of Islamic inferiority was the hijab, in fact, Christians, Jews, and Muslims in Cairo all wore some, some form of head covering. So Qasim Amin published a book in 1899. Uh, he studied in Europe, by the way. He was an Egyptian lawyer who studied in France and was very close to the French. And in Egypt, he was close to the British rulers. And he wrote a book calling for the end of hijab and for, for women's unveiling. Uh, because he, and he argued that this was necessary for the progress of the nation, not just for the women, but the progress of the nation. And this became a, uh, something widely accepted by the ruling classes of Egypt. And that was why, the, the, historically, why people like me and my mother never wore hijab, because we were the products of an era which inherited the British belief that hijab was a sign of Muslim inferiority, and therefore we don't need to wear it. When I began to think about the question in the mid-1990s, the hijab was very rare still in America. I had no students who wore hijab back then. So at that point, I began to ask myself, so why are they wearing hijab in America? You know, I didn't wear it in Egypt 50 years ago. Why did, it doesn't mean we gave up Islam, but why, did they, why is it becoming now important? And in order to answer that question of why women in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and the United States were wearing hijab, I found myself I had to go back and study uh, Egypt, because Egypt was the source of the spread of the, of the wearing of the hijab in the late second half of the 20th century. And, and again, let me speak personally, I began by assuming that they, the fact that they were wearing it was something anti-feminist, something patriarchal. They were accepting some patriarchal way of thinking about women. Uh, and I began by thinking, well, it must be some kind of fundamentalist, anti-Western Islam. That was my starting point. And you can see the, how my own assumptions were marked by my own heritage growing up in Egypt in the era when colonial ideas of the inferiority of Islam or the backwardness of veil were normal. I grew up in that world, and many people of my generation well, some people are very angry at women wearing hijab today. And I started not, not by being angry, but by being baffled. And I wanted to answer, what, what does it mean? Are they fundamentalists? Are they anti-feminists? What is it? And I found uh, that there were lots of reasons, practical reasons. Now, I'm leaving aside the question of, its rel of the religious belief. You know, I'll, one can just assume that that's an important key element. But I am based my, my uh, observations on the studies that were done at the time by, uh, by anthropologists and various uh, scholars of that kind, asking women, why are you wearing hijab? What, what does it mean to you? And a lot among the answers they gave was um, disenchantment with the corruption of society that they were standing for just, that they wanted to, a, new, a new kind of society, and also that gave them rights. So they had the right to go and to work now. You, in the old days, it was awkward for women to work in an office full of men. Uh, as they put on hijab, they could say, well, you know, we're Islamically covered. You have no right to discriminate against us. And so they, this was a way of getting jobs, and they also it empowered them within the family because they could tell their parents, yes, we can go out alone. If their parents objected, say, we know, we're Islamic women, and we, we show it in our dress, and uh, we have the right to do this, to go out, to pursue our positions and jobs. So it, was, it, was a, it, was not a, it did not lead to their oppression. Dr. Ahmed elaborated on the hijab being problematical for women in the U.S., even a danger to life in direct contrast to Egypt, where the hijab has actually made life easier for women. In the media, there was a very strong anti-Islamic uh, wave after 9-11. And, you know, as you, I'm sure you heard, it was people heard all over the world, there were women in hijab who were attacked in the streets. I know one of my students once in, my, in, my, in one of my classes arrived in class in a terrible mess. Somebody had tried to pull her hijab off and had spat at her and pushed her off the pavement. And it was, there were these kinds of events happening. In fact, one of the young women I asked, why, what does wearing hijab mean to you and why do you wear it? Uh, she said among the reasons that she wore it was 
the same reason that her Jewish friends, wore, uh, male friends, wore a yarmulke. It's a way of saying we're a minority. We have a right to be here. These are our rights, and you should respect us, and you're not, you should not be contemptuous of us. So, so uh, it's it's a uh, an assertion. It's rather like, in terms of asserting your right and your dignity, like the Afro in the 1960s. Despite Dr. Leila's discovery that the hijab frees women, some European countries have banned it in schools. We went to one of these schools and watched the girls entering. It was heartbreaking. There are also non-Muslims who find it hypocritical to prevent Muslim girls from wearing the hijab at school. Government should not prohibit wearing hijab or wearing clothes you want. If a girl can walk in a bikini, then why don't a girl can walk in a hijab? I mean, it's the same. One choice is not the same as another. If a girl comes in a miniskirt to school, then why can't a girl come protected to a school? So I think it's, it shouldn't be that way. Both men and women complement each other. They are on the same status. God has not discriminated between men and women in acts of worship or in the rewards that they get out of these acts of worship. That is why we can see that Islam has emancipated women in the sense of giving them new positions. As before, before Islam, there was no liberation in that sense. So we have, for example, a lady called Ashifa bint Abdullah. She used to be the administrator of the souk or the market. And she used to have the job of a policewoman. She would hold people accountable for any cheating that happened in the market, which means that she's almost a judge in this sense. And women held several positions uh, along the line after many years after Islam spread. They were actually also jurors they would give uh, uh, juridical verdicts, and this happened in Andalusia. Women used to put lanterns at their doors to invite people to come and learn from them. Aisha, peace be upon her, herself was a, a scholar in her own right, and she used to disseminate the verdicts that the Prophet could not give to women concerning women issues. She was a scholar, and she actually corrected many of numerous Sahabas about the verdicts that they gave concerning uh, Islam and concerning the rulings of Islam. Well, one of the extraordinary things that I found, having begun by assuming that women who wore hijab were more accepted patriarchy and were not feminist, it was very surprising me, for me to discover that actually some of the most feminist uh, Muslims in, of, the, of the younger generation in America were women who wore hijab. They were fighting for equal rights, they were fighting against domestic violence, they were very active in all the spheres for women's rights. You know, when I watched uh, the uh, Tahrir revolution, I saw a lot of women in hijab who were the ones who were calling for rights for women as well as for men. Many of these women that I'm talking about would not call themselves feminist, because feminism has, the word itself has uh, implications about they're not calling for equal rights in the American sense, in a way. They're calling for um, equality, equal justice for women. For it's, it's quite a complicated idea. I mean, it's, so it's not that they just want equality the way secular feminists want equality. There are two different ways of looking at women. There are movements in this world. One of the movements is called secular feminism. Um, and this is basically secular gender feminism. The other one is equity feminism. Gender feminism would like to, to regard women as a single entity, that they are emasculated, that they are macho, that they can do anything. Maybe that would be contrary to their own natures, but they can do anything. Now, equity feminism is more, more or less like Islam, and it does cover all the rights that women in Islam would like to have, and that actually women in Islam have been given 1,500 years ago. That is why it is important to look at women as part of a context. This context is the family. So when God Almighty created Adam, he created Eve, and then came the descendants. That is why women are part of a family, their fathers, their mothers, part, they are sisters, they are daughters, um, that is why we should not look at them at, as a single, emasculated entity.
Islam does give women rights. Um, over 1400 years ago, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, received the Holy Quran as a revelation that uh, not only acknowledged women's rights, but protected those rights. Women did have a role in politics during the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, there was a female Sahaba, uh, Um Salama, or a female companion of the Prophet, who did uh, provide consultation for him. Um, women also had the ability to vote during the time of the Prophet, which is uh, prior to the women's suffrage movement of the 20th century, where women only recently began to, to get their right to vote in the 1920s, 1940s, 1970s. The women's suffrage movement got the vote for women in the United States of America in the 1920s after a long struggle. They only got it in France in 1945 and in Switzerland in 1970. That was over 14 centuries after women got it at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, who called upon all men and women and told them that there was an army of 4,000 men marching towards the city of Medina and asked them to vote both men and women, whether to go out and face them or to wait in Medina and fight them in the streets of the city. He accepted the decision of the majority even though his opinion was different. Women were degraded by most ancient cultures. The Romans, the Greeks, Persians, Arabs. Arabs actually considered having a female baby a bad omen, and some of them used to bury female babies alive. Then suddenly someone came along to tell women, you are equal with men before God. You are equal with men before the law. That was an incredible paradigm shift. Islam tells women they are equal with men but different. They can do some things better than men and men can do some things better than them. You complement each other. Me being a Muslim makes me a feminist because I believe in women's rights. Um, and any Muslim man should be in that de definition, he should be a feminist too. Um, there shouldn't be any fear or favor when it comes to granting the rights that Allah has given us. Uh, as a Muslim woman, it is particularly important to me that every sector of society has the rights that God has given them. These are literally God-given rights. And there are countries in our societies where that's not happening. And in those societies, we should be calling for those rights to be given. It doesn't make us feminists necessarily, but it means that we are Muslims who are aware of our rights as Muslims. And when people look at Islam, they often cast Islam. Again, you've got that symbol of Islam as the ultimate oppressive religion to women and people always ask this question then in that case why are so many women becoming Muslim why are so many women willing to subject themselves to this oppressive religion and subject themselves to this oppressive scarf and all this kind of thing and very much for those people it is about changing your lens because you see oppression where others see freedom you see liberation where others see shame and uh, for anybody who is looking at Islam and wants to know what is the Islamic take on this? Why is this happening in Muslim communities? Our answer is always go back to the Quran. Go back to the Quran and go back to the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For me, I came from a feminist background. I was raised pretty much in a feminist household. And it was the personage of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. His manner, the way he was with wives, children, uh, c companions, anybody else around him. It was his personage more than anything else that made me see the beauty of Islam. Because the way he treated those people around him, let's look at it this way. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had no sons, no heirs. Uh, his wives, he had children from his first wife, no children after that. This is in a society where girl children were scorned, were buried alive, had no worth whatsoever. And this is not just in Arabian society, and it's not just 1500 years ago. You have societies today where this is still happening, where girls are considered less than boys, where it's a shame to have a girl, where if you have a boy, you're a queen. If you have a girl, nobody speaks to you. This is a reality that's happening in our world today. So at this particular time, God chose to send a messenger who would have no son and heir, who would only have a few children compared to the number of wives that he had. You've got a prophet who used to help his wives in the house. You've got a prophet who used to serve himself. He used to mend his own shoes, 
who used to say when he was asked, who do you love from amongst the people? He would say his wife's name before anybody else's name. He was a feminist. If anybody was a feminist, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, according to my definition, he was the ultimate feminist. In the last sermon Prophet Muhammad gave before he died, he mentioned that um, men should treat women kindly and that they should treat them well because women are their partners and their helpers. And that was his last sermon before he died. That was the last message he was ever going to give anyone. And that was part of his message that you must treat women kindly. And so obviously that's a very big part of religion if that's in his last sermon, that's the last message he'll ever give the Muslims who are alive then. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, set a standard of helping his wives in the kitchen. Uh, modern Muslim husbands also help their wives in day-to-day -day lives. Islam has made my marriage and my uh, life with my spouse more peaceful. Uh, we can truly love each other because we have standards of what love is. Um, prior to accepting Islam, I was caught up in the ideals of, you know, what does it mean to have a marriage and what is romance and, you know, I want to have a romantic relationship and Islam has made our relationship truer and more solid, more secure. In nearly all the interviews with the 12 converts, there was something they all highlighted as being an attraction to Islam. Freedom. Before I, I became a Muslim, I had a lot of misconceptions about Islam, especially concerning women. I really thought that this was a religion in which women are forced to dress a certain way, they're not allowed to go outside, they're not allowed to learn, they're not allowed to work, they're not allowed to be a human being. This is really what I thought. But after I converted, I found out that all my misconceptions, all, my, I, all the ideas I had about women in Islam were wrong. And I found out that it's, 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 it's liberating. It's, and, and it's not just liberating, it also allows you to, you know, in Islam we, we work, we, we are allowed to own businesses, we can, we, we're allowed to divorce if we're unhappy, we, you have to ask us our permission to get married. Um, all the things that bothered me before, they're simply not true. I see that in Islam, as a woman, I can be who I want to be. I can work. Mo another important thing is I can dress how I want to. I'm not um, pushed by uh, the media, by the fashion of the day. I can, uh, my body is my own. I'm, I'm free from all the looks of people. I'm, I'm free from all the pressure of, of being too skinny or being too fat or walking on high heels or wearing certain ex super expensive designer clothes that after you wear them twice, you gotta buy new ones. I can just focus on my real life. I can focus on my family, I can focus on my work, I can focus on my God, I can focus on myself. I don't have to focus about what everybody else thinks about me. And I think this is one of the things that is so attractive in Islam for women. You are valued for the person you are. You're liberated from having to be uh, an object, uh, having to be something that, that's only there for being beautiful. You are you're free to express yourself, you're free to work, to be a mother if you want to be, because you don't have to work, you can. That's another difference. Uh, Islam is providing me more liberty, because being a woman in Islam, I can choose if I want to go to work. Being a married woman in Islam, my husband needs to provide for me. I also have the liberty to choose if I stay at home and educate my child or not. Um, and I choose to stay at home and educate my child. I also feel more freedom. In Hong Kong, every woman has to work. Even you are a man, you will think women have to work for the family. But in Islam, actually, man has the responsibility. I can choose to work, and you cannot disallow me to work, but I can choose to work or not. The concept of original sin and the freedom of women, because people had thought that a uh, woman was the cause of all evils. She is the one that tempted Adam. She is the one that asked him to eat from the tree. 
Consequently, all women were evil and they were seducers. But of course, when the concept of original sin was clarified in the Quran that God had forgiven Adam and Eve and that Eve did not commit this sin and that Adam himself had committed it by himself and uh, both of them were forgiven, so also women were free from this kind of concept that would restrict their freedom. The freedom that I, that I long for is the freedom to worship my Creator and to, 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 to do what is pleasing to Him. And that for me is freedom. So the fact that I wear the scarf or I wear the niqab, people say I'm unfree. But freedom is in the eye of the beholder. Because when I look at some people, for example, who maybe are involved in unhealthy lifestyles, they consider themselves free. I consider them unfree. So it's very much a matter of perception. And certainly for the Muslim, the freedom that we all are striving for is the freedom to worship God as He deserves to be worshipped and to fulfill our ultimate potential as worshippers of God and as the creation, as His creation. Uh, so it's, it's something that elevates you. It takes you above the concerns of this world, above the attitudes and ideas and values of this world and elevates you to now you're living according to the laws of your Creator and you are fulfilling the commands of your Creator, not a man, not an Imam, not a community, not a culture, but the Lord of everything. In Islam, freedom equals life. According to the Quran, if a person kills another by accident, he can seek atonement by freeing a slave as the first option. This means that if you take the life of someone by mistake, give freedom to someone deprived of it, since you cannot give life to someone who's dead. God described the Prophet Muhammad in the Quran as a liberator. The Quran says, He releases them from their heavy burdens and the chains that were upon them. During college, I would research it a lot in my free time. I would get Quran verses sent to me in my email from a certain website. And I eventually developed the sort of philosophy of it without actually converting. I just, I held all the beliefs, although I never converted to Islam. Um, I didn't know any Muslims personally in New York, and I didn't know where to find them. But uh, I knew myself to be a Muslim. Amber said something I have heard many converts say. She said that she did not convert to Islam. Islam was inside her. All she had to do was find it. When I met Islam, I understood that this was inside me all the time. And what I did was fulfilling. Yes, I, I take from outside knowledge, but uh, it was inside. It was like a fire that needed some uh, to, to light up more. Now that I'm converted, I have, I have something beautiful and it's called the prayer. We pray five times a day, which means that five times a day I relax. Five times a day I'm in meditation. Five times a day, I give my worries to my God, to my Creator. And this is, this is my favorite thing in Islam. If, if you've never prayed, go for it, just try. It, it'll, it'll save you. It saved me. What converts always express about liberty being an aspect that attracted them to Islam seems opposite to what a person may see in some Muslim societies which apply their own old cultures and just flavor them with Islam. This does not do justice to Islam. Therefore, if any society or individual oppresses women or discriminates against them, it is against Islam, not because of it.